Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. We're going to wait just a minute to let others join us, and then we'll begin today's conversation. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to wait just a minute to let others join, and then we will begin today's exciting conversation. Certainly welcome to the latest installment of Homeroom with Education Leaders. Today's discussion is focused on empowering family school partnerships for student achievement. My name is Jalil Hart and I have the pleasure of serving as the Deputy Director of the K-12 team here at the Hunt Institute. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Institute, we were founded by four-term North Carolina Governor Jim Hunt, and we love serving as a resource for policymakers on education issues from prenatal through higher education. We offer uh, in-person and virtual convenings, uh, conduct research, and offer other forms of technical assistance to states across the country. So before we jump into the conversation today, I want to provide a brief logistical overview of how our time together will, will run. We'll start with about 30 minutes of a moderated discussion uh, with our panelists, and then we'll pivot to a Q&A with the audience. So if you have any questions throughout the discussion uh, based on the conversation, anything that resonates with you, please feel free to submit those in the Q&A feature on the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we'll do our best to address them during our uh, Q&A session. We will record this conversation, um, and in the next few days, we'll post it to our YouTube channel. We also encourage you to join us on Twitter where you can participate in the conversation using the hashtag EdHomeRoom. So let's jump in. We're so appreciative of the panelists uh, who are joining us today. So according to the Hunt Institute's Across the Aisle report, more than eight in 10 voters believe that parents should be included in their child's education. And about seven in 10 voters agree that parents that parents are included in their child's education and what they are taught. Additionally, voters see a major role for teachers in determining curriculum, as well as for parents of school-aged children, uh, highlighting the, that despite narratives placing these groups at odds with each other, voters see both groups as necessary for curriculum oversight. In recognition of this importance, today's conversation will discuss the significance of engaging families in school partnerships and explore strategies to help expand its collaboration. To that end, I'm excited to in introduce our speakers for today. We have Dr. Karen Mapp, who is a professor of practice at Harvard University. I'm an author and leading scholar in the area of family school partnerships. We have Ari Kessler, who is a school family partnerships consultant and author of the award-winning book, On the Same Team, Bridging Educators and Underrepresented Families Together. Uh, he leads the family partnerships department for the Boulder Valley School District in Colorado and is a speaker, trainer, and coach working with schools and districts committed to forging stronger school family partnerships. And finally, last but not least, we have Brian Tunstall, who, is a, who serves as principal of Pleasant Union Elementary School right here in North Carolina. Thank you all so much for joining. Um, and with that, we'll jump right in. Dr. Mapp, the first question is for you. Can you provide an overview of the dual capacity building framework for family school partnerships that you helped develop with U.S. Department of Education and speak to what this might look like in schools? So first of all, I wanna thank you for having me today. I appreciate it. And so the dual capacity building framework was first authored in around 2011, published in 2013. And I was very fortunate to have been asked by the U.S. Department of Education to work with their staff on some guidance 
four states and districts and schools on what effective family school community engagement should look like. This is actually version two of the framework. The first one that was published around 2013 looked different than this. It was more of a vertical orientation. But as soon as that one was published, I actually started to go around the country and ask people, uh, was, it, was it helpful? How were they using it? Because again, it was designed to be a guide, guidance for practitioners uh, to figure out what does effective practice entail? Because what the Department of Education was concerned about was that the federal dollars that were being um, targeted towards family engagement, like in Title I, were being used in ways that maybe were not that effective according to the research. So this is a research-based framework. And so what they said to me was, can you provide us with some kind of narrative guidance framework that help practitioners really see what effective practice looked like, what it entailed, and then what they could expect when it came to outcomes if they put this, this practice in place. So the second version of the framework that you see here that I published, as I said, in 2019, took into account some of the feedback we got from the field on how the framework could really be effective in helping them. They, one of the things they said was, could you set it up more like a logic model where you start with the challenges, which was what you see on the left-hand side, and then move towards the outcomes that we want, which are effective partnerships that support student and school success and improvement. The real meat and potatoes of the framework is that purple section, which is labeled the essential conditions, because this is what tells practitioners that these are the things, these are the conditions that you need to create in order for effective partnerships that lead to the kind of outcomes that we want in terms of our student outcomes and our school outcomes, what those practices need to look like. So what I've been finding in my research and work across the last 30 years around family engagement is there's a lot of stuff that people are doing that my friend Kate Gil Cressley refers to as random acts of family engagement. So we sort of do all these things that we've done for the last 30 or 40 years. We don't really know why we're doing them. They don't work. We still do them anyway. Uh, what this purple section does is to say, hey, from the research, we now know what high impact strategies actually look like. And so the process conditions are six elements that you can align to your practices, that you can integrate into your practices that are high impact. And then the organizational conditions are what our school systems, the systems and structures that our districts, our state and the federal government need to provide to provide the kind of support and infrastructure to make sure that the process conditions can actually take hold. The green section talks about, all right, once we start building in those effective practices and conditions, what are the first set of outputs that we can expect to see? And that's where we see the adults, both the staff, the educators, and the families, because this is a dual capacity building framework, right? We're talking about building the capacity, not just to the families, but also the educators and practitioners that they want to form partnerships with. What do we start to see in terms of the capacity that actually gets built among the adults in the child's ecosystem. So we start to see that people get more skilled when it comes to family engagement. So their, cap their capabilities increase. We see that they start to make better connections with each other. So there's social networks on the part of both the families and the educators increase. The way we think about each other, our mindsets about each other in this work. So our cognitions, our beliefs about each other begin to shift to more of an asset-based mindset about each other than deficit-based mindsets about each other. And then finally, we just get more confident in our ability to pull this off, right, to do this work well. Once we do that, we see that educators are now empowered to work with families in different ways. Families are also engaged in diverse roles. We're working together in partnership. That's what the framework tries to connote with these two pieces coming together, like two pieces in a puzzle fitting together. And then once we are doing that, we're, you know, now we're working together in partnership with cooking with gas, 
we're now able to create these conditions in our schools where our students are doing better and our schools are also improving. So that's a really, really quick uh, and a short explanation of what the dual capacity framework is and what its function is and what it's been used for. Thank you so much for sharing it. Ari, I'd like to shift to you so that you can kind of build on some of that um, in, in our conversation today. So as an author and consultant uh, specializing in this work, what are some practical and immediate actions ed educators can adopt to establish and enhance trust and collaboration with minoritized families? Uh, what approaches have you found effective in bridging cultural communication gaps and how can schools ensure these strategies are sustainable and impactful over the long term? Yeah, thank you, Julio. It's a joy and privilege to join you all in this conversation. Very special to be with Dr. Mapp, one of my role models in the field. Um, you know, I think this question gets to the heart of what matters most. You know, as we emerged from the pandemic, I was really hopeful it would provide that deeper window, you know, as we saw teachers and families' worlds more closely, um, it would lead us to take family partnerships to new heights. Um, and I I think Dr. Mapp and others wisely talked about using this chapter of disruption as the springboard for innovation. We're building great momentum in the field, but I also see in my day-to-day -day work with a pretty diverse array of schools, it's easy for us to fall back on traditional approaches because we're also overstretched. So I think a key question is, what do we do to elevate our efforts? I think first, and, you know, and I'd say that the dual capacity framework Dr. Mapp was just illuminating was a massive gift because it highlights the importance of strengthening educators' foundations for forging partnerships because we tend to focus on family engagement through the lens of what families need or how they can be better partners. Um, and I, I deeply believe the onus needs to be more on us around initiating these, you know, the high impact practices that Dr. Mapp was just speaking to. Um, and I think when we're honest about it, we have so much to learn from families, particularly underrepresented families. You know, the last MetLife teacher survey revealed that family engagement was the area that educators feel least confident about. So I'm thrilled we're diving into what practices would support. And you know, I think as a result, the most important thing is to build in time for professional learning that builds capacity and perhaps more importantly, staff time for actually engaging in high leverage practices, knowing how squeezed everybody is for time. Um, and then you know, before jumping into a few concrete practices, starting with the why, knowing that we've got to build that deeper buy-in before moving to the what and the how. Because um, as Dr. Mapp has said many times, it's about creating that mindset shift. Um, we need everyone to see school family partnerships as essential to cultivating an effective classroom and school community. And the research out of Chicago more than a decade ago showed it's one of the five key levers for moving from a good to great school or district. Um, and there's obviously a host of benefits. Um, so to address the question, Julio, more directly about immediate practice, I think Engaging in proactive outreach early in the year, that might be welcome back phone calls, neighborhood walks, inventories on students and family strengths, interests, hopes, and dreams, um, making back to school night more connective and purposeful. I'm working with a few schools where reinventing events to make them more relationship-centered is a real priority. And then probably if any question could be asked in the first month of school, I think the most valuable one is asking families, what's, your, what's our best way of communicating? and then differentiating according to their preference. Um, you know, I connect with a couple hundred families each month through our Families and Educator Together teams. Um, and we keep hearing that families want more text and video, not just email. One teacher leader I work with did an inquiry in October with her class of 20 families. More than half of them said they'd never read a single email from her, the school, or the district. Uh, so really pivoting to communicate in the ways that uh, foster ongoing relationship and communication and meet families' needs. Um, and that, you know, is ideally, when I, when I think about the deep bonds with friends and families, it's not through emails. You know, we're texting them often, ideally picking up the phone and connecting in person. Um, as we move in, I think it's, you know, viewing every interaction with families as an opportunity to deepen trust. Uh, it's moving beyond a focus on events to privileging ongoing relationship building. Um, and then, you know, one strategy that I have seen some of the best teachers do is just making themselves visible and available to connect individually with families outside their classroom door before or after school. Um, another big one is positive outreach. The, the one I drew upon most as an APN principal was positive phone calls. And, and I think it's critical to calendar that. I put 15 to 20 minutes every Friday to make at least five positive calls by the end of the year. 
you know, that was more than half the families at our elementary school. Um, so the critical piece of school leaders carving out time to do this positive outreach. Um, I'm also a huge fan of relationships that are home visits. Um, and, you know, there's great research on how they're reducing chronic absenteeism and a host of other benefits. And they really allow us to meet human to human. And, you know, as I heard Dr. Mapp in Atlanta last month talking about, as Margaret Wheatley speaks to, listening can be healing, connective, and really transform relationship. And then lastly, I would say, create ongoing, well-designed gatherings for families to give input and deepen trust with staff at your school or in your district. You know, the team's approach is really at the heart of my book on the same team. And similar to how PLCs help teachers learn how to collaborate better with each other, I think there's a real need for structures for educators and underrepresented families to learn from each other. Um, you know, as Dr. Mapp has said consistently over the years, all too often, we treat families as spectators, and they possess so many insights to help us strengthen our engagement practices and essentially create more inclusive and connected and cohesive school communities. So providing the time and space for us to learn from each other, um, and ideally either launching a team of this sort or layering in the elements into the existing structures in your school. You know, I think we have to be really intentional and not leave family engagement efforts up to chance. Otherwise, we really risk preserving the status quo. Um, and a team approach ensures it's an ongoing vehicle, prioritizing partnerships that are cultivating more staff and family champions of the work, and we're creating steady transformation rather, rather than engaging in those random acts of engagement that Dr. Mapp was just speaking to. Thank you so much, Ari, and, and, and your comments are a great segue um, and to Brian, what I wanted to, to, to ask you about. So as you know, uh, family engagement contributes to positive student outcomes, including student achievement. I mean, your experience as a school leader, what key practices have you found most effective in creating inclusive um, environments for, stu for both students and their families? And can you highlight some specific programs or events that exemplify uh, some of these practices in your school? Absolutely. Thank you all so much for having me on the panel today. Um, I guess I'll start with uh, uh, the biggest thing that I've seen is it starts with that grassroots teacher communication with parents, um, very much what uh, the last two speakers have kind of been uh, alluding to. Uh, so much of it when I first came into Pleasant Union was I realized we actually need to train teachers like this needs to be professional development, not just on math and reading curriculum, but how do we actually talk to parents on a regular basis um, because it is so impersonal to just send an email. And so like, how do we have those conversations via phone, via text, um, via video, whatever it means, how do we get them into the building? Um, and just little things like when you're sitting with a parent, how are you sitting? Do you have a table between the two of you or are you sitting beside them like reviewing work together? Just those minor things sometimes can make a big difference in a parent's perception of how that teacher feels about them and their child. Um, and then I, uh, I think also validating, uh, parents, I think that's something we just don't do enough of. We kind of just sometimes come across too cold and clinical, uh, and get too much in the weeds with our edu, edu talk. And so making sure that we're hearing what parents are saying, validating what they're saying and saying, we see the same things you're seeing at home. How can we, how can we support what you're doing at home? in the classroom and then vice versa. Here are the ways that you can support what we're doing in the classroom at home. Um, and then really making sure that uh, we get parents out to the uh, school, not just with random events, uh, kind of as Dr. Mapp talked about. I think that was one of the things that COVID actually gave us an advantage um, because it kind of got us to reset and really think when we were allowed to start bringing parents back into the building, what, what events were successful, what events weren't successful, um, what does success look like when we get parents out? Does it just mean we got 200 kids and parents to come out to the building on a Saturday? Or is it they actually came out and engaged with curriculum and engaged with teachers and with IAs and actually had a really great time and wanted to come back or wanted to stay longer? I have to kick them out of the building, right? So it's looking for those types of uh, uh, markers of success. Um, and then I think something that we really, uh, because especially in public education, we forget about, we discount uh, public relations and PR. Uh, and I think that's something that we need to make sure of because that's half the battle sometimes is fighting previous perceptions or community perceptions of a school. 
Um, and so making sure that we're, we're looking at some of those online rating systems. When I give tours uh, in the spring to possible uh, students who might wanna transfer to my school from another school in the district, they know what rank I am for US News and Report and what rank I am on this website or that website. So making sure that I'm not just leaving that to chance, but actually talking to parents within my building and making sure they're going actually and giving us ratings on the websites uh, that exist out there so that when parents are looking and researching and thinking about moving to our area, they already know and have a good perception of our school before they even walk through the doors which just makes our job easier to connect with them and bring them kind of into the fold. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective. I really appreciate it. Um, and with that, I would love to ask a follow-up question for all of you. And as I do that, as a reminder, please remember to submit your questions for our panelists in the Q&A section at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, so as you all have alluded, partnerships are key to successful family and community involvement. How can schools assess the effectiveness of their initiatives to engage families and what metrics or methods can be used to ensure that these partnerships are positively impacting student uh, educational outcomes? Dr. Matt, we'll start with you and then we'll go to Ari and Brian. Thank you. Well, the, the first thing I want to emphasize here is that we've got a, I think one of the biggest changes that I want to see happen when we talk about family and community engagement is for people to understand that engagement is a strategy and not a goal. So what do I mean by that? A lot of times I'll see uh, districts and schools say, Dr. Mapp, we wanna increase our family engagement. We wanna increase our partnerships with families. And so we have a, a checklist of all these engagement activities that we want to um, embrace and they measure their engagement by how many activities they've had and how many people show up. That's only the beginning of the story here because when I ask them this question, why do you wanna engage your families? For what? It's not just about making nice with families because then when you do that, it becomes optional, especially in the eyes of teachers and other people who have goals. They have achievement goals, they have literacy goals, they have attendance goals. Your engagement is a strategy to achieve those. You, so you see, now you see it as not a nice to have, but an essential. Because as Ari alluded to, we have research that says, if you want a successful classroom and a successful school, engagement has to be a part of your strategic plan to get there. If you don't have the engagement as a strategy, you're not gonna achieve the goal of a successful student in a successful school. You may get ephemeral um, achievement gains, but they're not systemic, they're not sustained. So that's the biggest shift I'd like to see educators make is that you know, your, your engagement, that, the engagement we're talking about here is not an add-on, it's not a nice to have, it's not optional. It is a part of what makes us proficient as educators is that family and community engagement piece. And so unfortunately what's happened over the years is that it slipped away out of the training for teachers and principals and superintendents. We're trying to put it back because now again, we have the research that says it's an essential component of our practice. Once you see that, then you can start tracking your engagement activities with your goals. So for example, in Richmond, Virginia, under the leadership of Dr. Shade Harris, one of my former students, she's using engagement strategies to lower chronic absenteeism. So now when she has her engagement initiatives and strategies, her contacts, she's able to then also see is chronic absenteeism coming down? So this is that connection. In the framework, we talk about your engagement has to be linked to learning and development. It shouldn't just be engagement for engagement's sake. So once you start saying, okay, I have a literacy goal, third grade literacy, we want kids to be reading at grade level. How can we then put together an engagement strategy that is linked to making sure our children are reading at grade level? So instead of having an open house where we just talk about the rules 
and where to sign up for this or that. We also make sure our families understand what our literacy goals are. We may be uh, introduce our families to, to some tips and tools that they can do at home around literacy. And then we can keep track of if we are engaging our families in conversations about literacy, if we are engaging our families in tips and tools around literacy, do we see our literacy rates go up as we engage our families? Okay, so that's the key here is that it, it's fine and it's, it's a first step to you know, make sure we track how many people show up at events and whatnot. But that's only the first piece of this. Where we really want to get sophisticated about our engagement is when we see it as a strategy for the goals we're trying to achieve. And then we link those activities initiatives to that goal. Okay, so that's, that's, the, that's the frontier we're trying to cultivate here with the framework and with other um, trainings that we're doing for educators is that don't see your engagement as just that, as this you know, piece over here that you wanna do. How does your engagement connect to the goals that you're trying to achieve for your students and your schools? That's where we're really moving forward when we talk about effective family engagement practices, high impact strategies. Thank you, Dr. Mapp. All right. Yeah, well, just to build off that and, and this idea of really integrating family engagement and elevating it into every piece, I, I, you know, I think there's a handful of key questions to ask. You know, one is, are you focusing on high impact practices? You know, have you taken a look at, as Brian was speaking to, you know, creating an inventory of all your existing events and practices and identifying which are most impactful? I, I always remember the words of the legendary coach John Wooden, who says, don't mistake activity for achievement. You know, we're doing dozens of things, but are we investing most of our time in two to three best practices and doing them deeply and well, uh, as well as creating those stop doing lists that I remember being so valuable as a principal. Um, I think another important question is, are you primarily event focused or are you shifting to centering family voices, building strong relationships and engaging in mutual learning? And when families share as they do in our team gatherings, these are the aspects of the academic and, and other elements of the school experience I wanna know more about um, that we can show at the end of the year that we've provided that supportive learning and we've answered all their questions over the course of the year. Um, I think another key piece, which is why I believe so much in the team approach is, are you expanding the number of family engagement champions on both your staff and amongst the parent community? Um, so it's not resting on the shoulders of one or two or three uh, folks at the school? And then are you demonstrating your commitment to stronger partnerships by allocating the time and funds, um, which, you know, Dr. Mapp, you were sharing in Atlanta, it's, it's a common theme of show us with your time and money what you value. Um, and then I think, you know, final question is, are you making certain practices systemic across the staff? We saw in our team's approach, deep work happening, stronger bonds, but unless we're engaged in transformative action projects, that are changing the way the entire staff is, in, is engaging in family partnership practices, then it's not as purposeful. Um, and in terms of practical approaches, I think it starts with centering the voice of families um, and building a trusting space to receive their ongoing feedback. That's some of the best data we can get. And doing it, you know, in the, you know, solidarity driven shoulder to shoulder way that Dr. Mapp and her colleague A.L. Bergman really, you know, put it. I think also gathering anecdotal data through great questions for families and, and, and to staff that help uncover gaps and really reveal blind spots, barriers, and biases that are informing the way that staff are engaging with families. Um, you know, we talk a lot about achievement and opportunity gaps, but what I've discovered through hundreds of families and educator together gatherings is there's seven other major gaps we've created and can remediate if we talk about the current state of engagement at school and the desired state. You know, and in case you're curious, what, what are those gaps? You know, I see regardless of the school, and they're always at different levels with this, but they're grappling with gaps around information, language, communication, relationship, trust, access, equitable access, and then equitable participation, whether that's after school opportunities or a host of other things. Um, and then I think to maintain families trust, we need to show follow through. So once we've heard families illuminate these gaps and co-created some possible solutions, having clear steps and getting very explicit on the who and when in terms of accomplishing them um, and setting some you know, numerical SMART goals and then celebrating them. In my local district, one of the high schools I work closely with, 
This year sent 1,480 postcards to students and families. And then we created a video to highlight that practice for other schools so that that kind of positive outreach can uh, multiply. Um, and then, you know, from exit tickets to one word, every voice is heard at the end of a gathering. Um, and, and also I think really pushing on school leaders, collaborating with them to determine how much specific set aside time they will give each semester for staff to engage in both professional learning around family engagement and to actually do high leverage practices. I'd say my biggest lesson in the last two years has been a lot of these great practices can be propelled if a principal says, hey, last 15 minutes of the staff meeting, go make five positive calls, the, the key piece of weaving in the time. Um, and then, you know, surveys can be really effective when they're concise and co-created with purpose questions, as well as rubrics, you know, Dr. Matt from Beyond the Bake Sale, her four types of partnership schools. Um, there's also a rubric um, I worked on these last years informed by Susan Auerbach's work on authentic partnerships. Um, I think a pre-post assessment it can be some of the most meaningful data to see how things are shifting with parents. You know, we asked questions like, do you feel the staff genuinely collaborates with you? Uh, do you feel respected? Is your culture valued and, and recognized and supported? Um, and I, you know, finally, I'd say the best data would be anecdotal and come simply from asking students and families about the impact of our staff's efforts to build stronger partnerships. Um, you know, I, I'm remembering a high schooler who came to a team gathering with his younger brother at a middle school alongside his father. And, you know, he said, when I was here at this middle school, our Latino families didn't feel so comfortable. Now that we have these gatherings, we can trust the school more and not hide. Um, and time and again, we've heard those kinds of sentiments from both students and families alike of the difference it makes when we create these spaces to hear their voices, which I think is some of the best data to inform our next steps. Thank you, Ari. Uh, Brian. Yeah, I'm going to echo a lot of what uh, what was just said, but I just want to emphasize like, we have to have the courage as school leaders to ask for that feedback sometimes. I think sometimes we rely a little too heavily on just getting feedback from our PTA presidents or you know the parents who are just always in the office anyway. Um, and we have to go beyond the people that are in our face uh, to actually get that feedback and, and then face kind of what, what is said. Um, and we do, uh, in my school district, we do an annual survey and it tracks the trends, uh, both for the entire district, but also our, our individual school to see what, um, and we're focused on communication and barriers to engagement in that particular annual survey. Um, but this, uh, but also giving them that open response uh, options when collecting that kind of quantitative data to see like what what kind of comments are they making, how can we improve with that, um, and then also seeking out kind of those anecdotal ways that we can make changes and improve their experience when they're at our schools, um, because that's that's really the biggest piece for me, again, that's gonna change the entire community's perception is, are you talking to those people that you don't see at every event, um, that you just see maybe once a year when they come in for a conference and just grabbing them for a few minutes and talking with them or using your teachers to get some of that feedback when they're coming in for conferences to ask questions like, how else can I help you? How else can the school help you? Um, and seeing what kind of answers you get. And that just gives your school improvement teams or leadership teams better opportunities to figure out uh, how do we best engage this community? Um, and then uh, I think as far as like around the strategies and how it's improving outcomes for students academically, I think it has to be built into whatever uh, your instructional focus is for schools. So for example, we're moving towards really doubling down on writing within our school community next year. And so already thinking about how do we get students to engage their parents with writing, be it that they are writing something in class or their homework assignment is something to do with writing and then they're reading it to their parents or interviewing their parents with that writing. Because when I go to talk to parents and ask them, hey, how's your year going? How's Billy's year going? I want them to say something around, the, you know, like, oh, I really love what they've been doing with the writing. It's been really cool to see some of those examples, not, not just, I had a great time at the spring party. As, as great as those comments are, we need to hear those, those academic and curriculum uh, accolades as well. Yeah, I, and I, I want to just jump in and say one thing about data. We could do a whole two, three hour 
webinar on data. And actually in my uh, family engagement institute that I run in the summer, and I'll do another one in November, we do almost a half day on this data question. What I usually say to people right off the bat is, you've got to be realistic about what is within your capacity to collect data. That's the first question you wanna ask yourselves. If you're a small school district or a small school, you know, be, be honest and say, what, what can we collect that's going to be reasonable for us? And then as like uh, Ari gave us a lot of different examples of a lot of different ways we can collect data. Some of them are, are, are easy to do and not that hard. Exit tickets when you have an event, et cetera, et cetera. But surveys have to be analyzed. Uh, the survey data has to be constructed. So, so you have to ask yourself, first of all, what can we handle? What can we handle? A lot of times, sometimes I see smaller places and schools feel like, well, you know, Dr. Mapp, we just can't collect any data that's that's worthwhile because it's too sophisticated for us. Anything you can collect is fine. You go with what you can do. And then as you get support, if you get help, if you get resources, if you have someone at the district level who can help you do things or put things, things together, there are a lot of things that are already out there. There are surveys that are already created that you can that you can um, use, um, but but I just wanted to say that because I can already feel through the airwaves, people's shoulders going up a little bit when we start talking about data collection because data collection is time consuming, right? But I always say to people, start with what you can do now. Don't, don't get nervous and say, oh, and throw up your hands and say, we're not collecting anything because this person over here said that exit surveys are meaningless. Well, they might not be meaningless to you if that's all you can do right now, okay? So I just wanted to put that out there so that people don't get nervous about if you can't do like a sophisticated randomized control trial, you know, um, that, 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 oh, we can't do anything. That's not true. Start with what you can do, start where you are now, and then you can, you can grow and um, do more. But, but don't get nervous about having to do something really sophisticated right off the bat. Thank you so much, all of you, for your thoughts around that. Um, those practical pieces are, are critical, so we appreciate it. I'm excited to turn out to some questions from the audience. Um, and for our panelists, feel free to just jump in and, um, and engage with these questions as you'd like. The first one is, um, and it comes from a retired teacher, have any strategies been considered for involving retired educators, many of whom are well-known and respected in the community in schools' family engagement efforts? Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> <laughs> I do know some districts that have used, have, have really reached out uh, to some of their, well, what happens in many cases, I've seen some students, some, some, some retired teachers who've actually shifted roles and become family liaisons. And they are fantastic because they bring in that link to learning piece into the engagement work because they're, they're already thinking as teachers about how can we um, leverage and, and connect our families with the kind of teaching and learning uh, strategies and procedures that we are trying to do. So I find that, uh, you know, former teachers really, in many cases, particularly those who have a family engagement mindset, um, sometimes will take on other roles, will work in community schools. So, I mean, the answer is yes, if you're out there, um, let yourself be known to your district. But, um, uh, you know, rather than retire, we've seen teachers take on some different roles in this family engagement space as coaches, as trainers. Um, I know when the Flamboyant Foundation in DC, uh, several of the people who've done Megan Lucas and others are former teachers and who are now doing national trainings around family and community engagement. Thank you for that. And that's a great segue to our to our second question, uh, thinking about the role of family liaisons. Uh, with the with chronic absenteeism at record highs, what suggestions do pan, do you all have for um, engagement strategies around attendance? I'll just share two that I've seen be particularly effective. And I mean, there's been pieces in the New York Times and elsewhere. A number of California districts, for instance, have been using home visits 
specifically to reduce chronic absenteeism. And the numbers last year, you know, dipped from something like 30% to 16%. So home visits are obviously making a difference. Um, I know, you know, Connecticut's LEAP efforts, those home visits specifically to support attendance. Um, and then I think the, the proactive outreach um, through positive calls, I remember in the middle of the pandemic working with a high school where we set up a positive call system and it was focused on which students and families do we most want to re-engage and connect with. Um, so I think that carving out the time for those proactive approaches um, make, make a huge difference. Those are, I guess, two big ones I would just quickly highlight. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add on to say that I think one of the biggest ways we see improvement in attendance is um, not making the negative phone calls um, and sending the threatening letters that the state makes us send or the district makes you send, um, but instead reaching out because the parents need to understand the value and why their child needs to be in school, but also the child needs to, to understand that too. So finding ways to reach out in positive manners, not just the threatening like, hey, you better come to school or we're going to send you to truancy court. That's that's not, uh, and it's shown after COVID, it's not really made a lot of difference within the district to do those types of strategies. So, um, and then also just finding ways to celebrate uh, the students when they do come, even if it's one day that week, we are going to, every person they see in the building, they're gonna be celebrated in some way. And that way the kid is feeling more enthused about coming to school and then also following that up with some kind of positive support for the parent like we are so appreciative that we got to see him three times this week like it really made a difference we saw growth in him in x y or z and i would um encourage people to look into the work that's been done in richmond virginia under the uh, leadership of dr shade harris and uh there she was just she just did a white house panel on this um, she had a whole initiative called We Love You Here out of Richmond, which basically did what Brian talked about was to turn the mindset around attendance into instead of it being punitive strategies, um, we're, you know, we're blaming families to an engagement mindset around positive reach outreach to families and saying, you know, let's figure out what are the barriers that are in place that are prohibiting families from being able to make sure their child is coming to school. And so it was a very um, asset-based mindset that they use for these strategies around uh, chronic absenteeism. Many of the schools in the district, and this was a systemic effort across the district, and many of the schools saw double digit decreases in chronic absenteeism. So I really people encourage people to look into the work that was done in Richmond, Virginia around this. Thank you all for that. Um, our next question is, can you all uh, talk about what, what you would think the top three suggestions are for a school to begin involving families? Um, and let's say that this might be a school that wants to start building their family engagement toolkit. Well, the first thing I think is the school needs to do a little bit of, as Sean Jinwright talks about, mirror work. Um, you know, a lot of times we um, we look at the strategies and we look at the books and we look at the tools, but the first thing we need to do is to do some reflection on how do we see our families? Do we have a mindset in our school of seeing our families through an asset-based lens or do we see our families through a deficit-based lens? Because one of the things that can happen is that you could take all the tools and all the practices that we've talked about today, but if your school and your practitioners and your educators see the families as there's something being wrong with them and them having to be fixed in some way and not seeing them as equal partners and not seeing them as having funds of knowledge and um, you know seeing them as real assets to the work, then you know that's going to be how you show up. And so consequently, I think doing the training that we've all three talked about first to talk about how do we see family engagement? How do we see our families? Do we understand our families are valuable people with lots of knowledge about their kiddos and their communities that we really need to be the best educators that we can possibly be? So I do think that some training on the part of you and your staff first is really necessary to, again, do a level setting. Where, where are we? What do we see? 
Then some other steps can be, you know, talking to your families. As Ari said, looking at this now is, is through the lens of a team approach. But um, I, I really would start first with that, like I said, holding up a mirror and saying, who are we? How do we see our families? How do we feel about our families? Because if if your staff is is seeing your families as through a deficit-based lens, then it's going to be very difficult for this work to move forward. So it starts with that internal reflection work first, I think. Yeah, I'm with you, Dr. Mapp. And I would say that once that's been accomplished, um, you know, I think about the value of looking flamboyant, scholastic, create that wonderful graph of high leverage practices. And they're not just great for relationship building, but they spark some of the best academic outcomes. So looking at what are a couple practices that would make the difference and then carve out the time. And if, if everyone's not ready, then go with, you know, the early adopters and they'll speak and, and you know, preach about the value and, and impact it's had in their own practice. Um, and I think, you know, then moving from there to creating an ongoing space to hear from families. And as Brian was referencing earlier, not just the couple most vocal parents and often most privileged, but um, a broad array of underrepresented voices. Um, and that then can become a, a vehicle for implementing across the staff some of the best practices that families illuminate. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of three practices for, for us right now in our school district, it, it's been home visits, a two-way app like Talking Points, and then prioritizing teams that can be a vehicle um, for so much of this work happening intentionally in an ongoing way, not this scattershot approach or the... Um, and the last piece I guess I would say is re-examining the events because as the flamboyant graph makes clear, we're not saying abandon these events, but how can we make them so much more purposeful? Because uh, I know as an introvert, I can go to a party, a gathering at school, never meet another person. Like how can we design it thoughtfully to foster more connections between families and educators as well as between families so that we're building up that sense of collective agency amongst our you know, parent and caregiver community. You know, when I um, did training with teachers on how to work with parents, the first question I asked, because of course, teachers are contacting parents, that's a regular practice for them, um, that's been ingrained for a long time. But I said, what, what do you want when you're contacting a parent? Um, you need to ask yourself that question. So I think that the, the, the mirroring work that Dr. Matt talked about is probably the most critical because um, if you're calling a parent because the child's behind in reading or because of a behavior in the classroom, what, what do you want the parent to do about it? Because every parent is doing the best they can, the best way they know how. And so if you think they can fix your child's behavior in your classroom, you are mistaken, they cannot. Um, that's, that's, we need to ask what we want from them and then in turn, okay, so then how do we turn that into a partnership, not a transactional relationship? Um, because it's not, we're a community, we're a village, we're all trying to raise this child together. Um, and it can't just be, um, okay, I need you to do this because it works for me. No, it has to be like, hey, we need this to happen because in all of our best interests, how do we make that? Brian, I just wanted to say um, right on to what you just said. And I remember the most beautiful answer I got one time was I, I was asking teachers, what do you want? in terms of your communication with families. And one teacher raised her hand and she said, I want all my families to know how much I love their children. You know, and that was um, a game changer for a lot of people to hear that because that's about transformational change. That's about transforming your relationship with that other human being. And it wasn't, I need them to do X, Y, Z. I need them to understand. She's like, I want them to know how much I love their child. And I think if I can let them know that, will be in a partnership for their child forever. And she's right. And that's the way she approached those phone calls. You know, I want to let you know how much I love your child. And I also want to let you know how much I, I love to hear you tell me about your child. And I love the relationship between me, you, me and you to support your child. So, you know, that's a whole different way of seeing this work, right? And um, so I'm glad you said that because it, it sparked my memory to tell that story about what she said about what she wanted from that partnership. Thank you so much for those thoughts. Um, I think we have one time for maybe one final question with some from for you all. 
Um, can you speak to the role school leaders and administrators have or play in fostering a culture that values and prioritizes family school partnerships? I'm gonna let these two gentlemen go because they are leaders and I will just tell you, it's everything. It's everything. Uh, the leadership really uh, sets the tone, but I'll let the two of them speak to the work that they've done. Yeah, you know, I'm thinking, you know, based Dr. Mapp on what you're sharing in Atlanta and just the impact of listening. Are you creating spaces where you as a leader show up to Brian's point to ask for and honestly hear about the lived experiences of your students and families day in and day out at the school. Um, I saw in the early years of our team's approach, the only schools where the work faltered was where the school leader's mindset was not one of passion for the work um, or real deep capacity. As one of my mentors says, cultural responsiveness is the capacity to be willing to be changed. Um, and so I think that's, that's a key piece in terms of leadership. And the other one I, I would highlight, which I mentioned earlier is, are you supporting your staff with both the training and the time to gain that positive feeling of joy and love when you make that positive call, you make that home visit and you see the ripples of it um, for every stakeholder. Um, we're in a space now in, in education where the time has to be created. It's, it's tough to ask folks to do that on their weekends or late into the evening. So are you as a leader showing you value family engagement you know, with, with your time, as well as um, supporting your staff with the kind of learning that will, um, as you both were speaking, to hold up that mirror and then inspire them to want to um, show that love through deeper partnership. Yeah, just to add, um, it, it certainly starts with us as the leaders. Um, teachers are, are overwhelmed right now, um, post-COVID with everything uh, uh, that, the world is thrown at them as people and also as professionals. And so I think it's about for teach on the educator side, it's about helping them understand that this developing these relationships makes our lives easier. Not just me as the administrator, because I'm going to get maybe less parent phone calls, but it's going to make your life easier because the kids are going to be more mindful in your classroom. They're going to be more engaged with the curriculum and the parents are going to be more likely to come in for conferences, to reach out to you, to communicate with you if they know that they have a partner in this work and somebody that wants to build bridges with them, that it's not just a, your kid's not doing X, Y, and Z, or your kid's behind in this subject or that subject. So really just making sure that as, on the leadership side that we're kind of establishing those norms um, of what we expect, but also encouraging our, our folks to understand that it, it is gonna make our lives collectively so much easier if we really embrace that village model. Thank you all for your, oh, go ahead, Are you have something else to add? Well, just Brian, you just sparked a, a memory of a school where, you know, the school leader said, let's get feedback on parent-teacher conferences. It was the second gathering of the year. And families said, these were all Spanish-speaking families at this gathering, they said, it felt rushed. We didn't feel heard. We felt like we weren't seen as the experts on our kids. Um, and the principal said, okay, over the next four months, let's redesign it. And it Really, I mean, it, it led to a 20 minute training for staff and more and more time for interpretation. So there was equitable voice and then staff really centering more of the voices of families to make sure it, it was not a sit and get experience and to make it truly more relational reciprocal. So I think some of these pivots we can make don't require a lot more time or money. It's listening and then following up on the insights of our families. Thank you for that. And we do have time for one more quick question that, and that's come from our audience. I think it's really important to, to touch on. I um, mean, it kind of speaks to what you were just talking about, Ari. What are some of the most effective strategies to engage families of cultural and linguistically diverse backgrounds? Well, you know, I think that one of the points that we're trying to emphasize here is that what we're really asking people to do is to listen to your families. And so um, I'm although that question's always a little tricky because the context of where you are really matters. And so what they may do in Albuquerque, for example, had a, the wonderful opportunity to be there 
last last fall um, for their you know culturally diverse families is very different than what we would do in Boston for our culturally diverse families. But the key is, is that they asked their families and said, what would make the difference for you? Um, and they made sure that they asked in the language that this family spoke. And they did listening sessions in Spanish, in Haitian Creole, in whatever language was appropriate. Um, and a lot of the family said, this is the first time you've asked me this in my language um, and allow me to respond in my language. And so, and then the school began, the school districts began to adopt strategies to make sure that, you know, they were doing all they could to meet families where they are. So I think the first answer to that would be to sit down and really honor the voices of your families in giving you feedback on what they need and what they would want and what would make what you're doing um, a lot more equitable for them, right? But the, the bottom line is, first of all, communicating in the language that's spoken at home, making sure that you, you find out, you know, what is the appropriate language. I say, you know, I even say to a lot of folks, learn a few phrases so that at least you can communicate with parents a little bit. They'll see you're trying. But the main thing I do think is to ask them um, what works. And, you know, there's a lot of wonderful tools out there now, too. I already mentioned talking points, which is a wonderful um a wonderful um, organization that helps with translation. Um, and so there's there's a lot of things out there, but I do think that the first step is to really ask your families. They will provide you with the guidance and the expertise that you need to make those changes. Yeah, I'll just add um, on, a, on a micro scale, I think the communication with the families from a school level is really important, like from the leadership, but then also within the individual teachers reaching out, whether it's through talking points, conversations, however. I'll give an example. So my fifth graders, when they um, are promoted, uh, we have a promotion ceremony for them at school. And then at the end of the ceremony, all the students are checked out by their parents and they leave and go to a local park where they have a cookout cake. They celebrate those kids' promotion as a community. It's not a school event per se. Um, and so lots of people, when, uh, when I get a new fifth grade teacher, they are immediately freaking out because they're like, oh my goodness, like the, what about these these kids? They're not gonna be able to get there. Parents are, and we say, call them, talk to them, figure out what they need so that they can get to this event, even though it's not our event per se. And um, it always is figured out. We never have a student that is left out of such a monumental event for these kids after they spent six years out of school. Um, and it's it's really, I, I think, one of the most beautiful things about our community, but it, it really takes that that one on one connection with that parent from a teacher to really say, hey, you know what, they're friends with this other student and those parents, they're willing to give you a ride, they'll pick you up and bring you to the event. Um, and that's all it takes. So I just that that microcosm is important. Yeah, just to echo a little bit what's just been shared, I mean, I think two-way communication, vital. I think of a middle school where a mom told us in April, I'm angry right now because I just found out my kid's failing. Um, why didn't I know in January or February? And, and that prompted, you know, now the principal gives, you know, 15 to 20 minutes every six weeks for academic text updates to families. Um, so that, that piece is it ties to academics and ongoing communication. And then trust, um, you know, how how is every event and experience being set up in a way that's going to deepen trust, which amongst other things involves a flip of who's doing the talking? Are we really listening to families the bulk of the time? Um, and then in those spaces, I think family learning is vital. I work you know, primarily with immigrant families, and there's so much that's complex and intricate about our school systems. And when you're left in the dark about that, it's hard to take advantage of opportunities for your kid or partner with staff if you're not aware of what a counselor does or what the social emotional learning, you know, protocol is at the school. So having that learning time and then and then coming back to co-creating meaningful change based on the wisdom of of everyone in the space. Are we creating ongoing gatherings? Not this like once a year we'll hear from families, but a more genuine ongoing uh, relationship. And just a quick add on um, to that, because that triggered in my head, you know, we are, schools are very complex. We are bureaucratic by nature. 
Um, and I think sometimes for those of us who live it every day, we forget how bureaucratic and paperwork driven and process driven um, our, our system is. And so, especially for those underrepresented communities in our schools who don't know how to navigate the bureaucracy of the American school system, um, I see that very much as uh, for my front office and for me and my assistant principal finding ways, how can we cut through some of that bureaucracy for families? How can we minimize that? Or how can we put it in ways that they understand, be it translating into native language or just finding ways, what can we cut or what can we circumvent to really make this uh, easier for those families? Absolutely. Thank you all again uh, for engaging in this wonderful conversation today. Um, and before we close today's discussion, I do want to turn you to our upcoming K-12 webinars. Our next conversation will be on July 18th at 2 p.m. Eastern, where we will discuss innovations in work-based learning experiences for K-12 students. Uh, so we'll drop their registration link in the chat, and we encourage you to join the Hunt Institute for a range, the range of our other webinars from our higher ed and other teams. Um, so again, thank you for that. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you again to our panelists, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.